billions of honeybees have disappeared across the world. Without bees, crops cannot be pollinated, and global food security is under serious threat. Even in Australia, once considered a safe haven for bees, the invasion has spread. Yet this land has proven more resilient than we thought. They have even turned themselves into a living laboratory, searching for ways to coexist with the deadly honeybee parasite. This journey has captured the admiration and attention of the entire world. But what price did they have to pay? And how can despair be turned into hope? That is the story of today's documentary. For decades, honeybee populations worldwide have been shaken by unpredictable invisible enemies. From North America to Europe and spreading to Asia, beekeepers have watched their colonies vanish at unbelievable rates. In the United States, some winters have seen losses of up to 40% of bee colonies, forcing the agriculture industry, especially California's almond growers, to spend billions of dollars each year renting bees for pollination. In China, some provinces have been left with no choice but to use tiny brushes for hand pollination. Meanwhile, in Europe, a combination of neonicotinoid pesticides, climate change, and loss of natural habitats has gradually emptied fields of bees. However, the most dangerous enemy remains the Varroa destructor mite. Once it invades, colonies can collapse after just one or two seasons, forcing beekeepers to rely on chemical miticides just to keep their bees alive. Amid this bleak picture, Australia was once considered the last fortress. Not just by luck, Australia's natural advantage as a giant island surrounded by ocean helped block invasive species. On top of that, it had one of the strictest quarantine systems in the world. Travelers bringing even a small jar of honey could face heavy fines. Thanks to this shield, before 2022, Australia had more than 530,000 commercial hives, exporting hundreds of millions of Australian dollars worth of honey every year. Among them, Manuka honey was called liquid gold, and Australian bee stock became the gold standard internationally because it was free of Varroa. But what Australian beekeepers had feared for decades finally happened. In June 2022, the number one enemy set foot in Australia for the first time. At Newcastle Port, the second busiest seaport in New South Wales, with up to 4,000 international ships docking each year, Quarantine officers discovered tiny red mites smaller than grains of sand clinging to monitoring hives. The test results were unmistakable. It was Varroa Destructor. The Newcastle incident stunned the global beekeeping industry. For over half a century, scientific reports referred to Australia as the last Varroa-free stronghold. Australian media at the time called it the 9-11, of beekeeping a turning point with no return. Immediately after the Newcastle outbreak was confirmed, the New South Wales state government launched the largest Varroa eradication campaign in Australian agricultural history. Within just 24 hours of the outbreak's discovery, New South Wales declared a biosecurity emergency and mobilized over 600 quarantine staff and volunteers across the Hunter region. A red zone with a 10-kilometer radius around the outbreak was locked down surrounded by a purple surveillance zone extending another 25 kilometers. They had to find every mite block, every escape route, and stop the spread before things got worse. It was truly an emergency campaign across all of New South Wales. The movement of bees was banned. Over 300,000 commercial hives were frozen in place, while checkpoints sprang up along highways. Agricultural police stopped trucks opening every hive for inspection. At the same time, scientists from CSIRO teamed up with the Beekeepers Association for widespread testing. Surveillance drones and special bee traps were deployed throughout Newcastle to detect wild bees carrying the disease. The government issued emergency permits to destroy hives, making the campaign even larger and more shocking, especially for small-scale beekeepers. The public was reassured that this was just a containment effort, not yet a full-blown crisis, but behind the scenes, officials were deeply worried. The New South Wales Minister for Agriculture insisted we have a chance to rewrite history by wiping out Varroa at the very beginning. If successful, Australia would be the only country in the world to completely eradicate this mite, a feat the United States, Europe, and New Zealand all failed to achieve. But why did Australian authorities react so strongly? Because for beekeepers worldwide, the name Varroa Destructor is almost a death sentence. Originating in Asia, this mite is less than one millimeter long, reddish-brown, and as tiny as a grain of sand. 
Jessica May, a Department of Primary Industries official, put it bluntly. Just one mite on a bee can carry many diseases. It does not kill right away, but it weakens the whole colony day by day until it collapses. The mite attaches to the bee's body, sucking out fat that acts like the bee's liver, quickly weakening its immune system. Infected bees develop shriveled wings cannot fly and become a burden to the colony. Varroa hides in brood cells right after the queen lays eggs multiplying rapidly under the sealed wax. While the outside of the colony may look healthy inside, the disease spreads quietly. In just one season in the tropics or two to three years in temperate climates, a colony can disappear completely. This is the main culprit behind colony collapse disorder, which has caused the United States and Europe to lose up to 40% of their bee colonies every year for decades. In Newcastle, just days after the first detection, the Australian Honey Bee Industry Council and the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries expanded the surveillance zone from 25 kilometers to 50 kilometers around the city. Still within months, the disease had spread across the state. Over 260 outbreaks were confirmed, stretching from the northern coast of New South Wales to near the Victoria border. Faced with this rapid spread, Authorities had to use miticides chemicals the United States and Europe have relied on for decades. But even here, danger loomed in the United States Varroa has become resistant to at least three main chemicals in just 10 years, forcing farmers to spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year rotating treatments. In New South Wales, a shocking decision was made to use fipronil in outbreak zones. This is an extremely toxic chemical. Just a few parts per billion can kill aquatic insects. As a result, over 14,000 hives were destroyed in four months, but at the same time, ecologists warned that hundreds of native pollinator species could be wiped out as collateral damage. After 14 months and over 100 million Australian dollars spent, the Australian government had to admit the strategy had failed. First, Varroa is too small and hard to detect. It hides in brood cells multiplying quietly. By the time it is visible, it has already spread to dozens of colonies. Many hives that seemed healthy were actually infected before the campaign even began. Second, people unintentionally helped spread it. Some beekeepers fearing loss of livelihood secretly moved hives out of quarantine zones. Just a few hives slipping through gave Varroa a free ride for hundreds of kilometers. Third, Australia's vast geography and environment made total control impossible. With over 530,000 commercial hives spread across the country, plus wild bees in nature, absolute containment was out of reach. Bees can fly up to five kilometers a day, and wild bees became mobile reservoirs outside any quarantine map. Fourth, the disease spread faster than expected. In just one year, there were nearly 300 outbreak sites from Newcastle stretching north to Coffs Harbor and approaching the Victoria border. Finally, time became the enemy. Every month of delay allowed Varroa to expand further. CSIRO experts warned once it spreads to multiple states, eradication on a continental scale becomes biologically impossible. When the Zero Varroa campaign collapsed, Australia did not just lose tens of thousands of hives. The entire multi-billion dollar agriculture industry began to shake. The almond industry was hit hardest. Each season, just Victoria and South Australia alone need 200,000 to 250,000 hives for pollination. When bees were locked down, flowers bloomed but did not set fruit. Hive rental prices soared from $65 per hive in 2019 to over $165 in 2023. The impact rippled through all fruit crops, apples, cherries, grapes, blueberries, watermelons, all depend on honeybees. Experts warned that even a 10% drop in production could push food inflation up by 2 to 3% in a single year. This means fruit wine and juice prices in American or Asian supermarkets would also be affected since Australia is one of the world's top exporters. For Australian farmers, it was a double shock, lost crops, broken export contracts while operating costs and loan payments still had to be made. Small farms had to leave orchards idle, while large companies spent tens of millions of dollars to import bees from other states or try artificial pollination. The federal and New South Wales government spent over $200 million in emergency aid, but according to the Department of Primary Industries, that was just the tip of the iceberg. If Varroa takes root, the honey industry will lose at least $48 million a year.
once the world's last major supplier of clean bees and honey Australia's downfall. Sent Japan, South Korea, and the United States major importers of Australian honey into a spiral of shortages and rising prices. After more than a year of burning to save the bees, Australia faced a harsh truth. All the destruction was like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. The might had spread beyond control. So in September, the New South Wales government made it official. They were abandoning the eradication strategy. Jessica May, Department of Primary Industries Research Director, said bluntly, This might is here, and it is not going anywhere. We are no longer eradicating it, is about management now. This was a historic turning point. For the first time, Australia, a country once proud to be the last Varroa-free stronghold, accepted its place alongside the United States, Europe, and New Zealand, living with the honeybee's deadly enemy. From then on, the battle moved from the national level down to each individual hive. Beekeepers were trained to detect infestations, early calculate intervention thresholds, and apply flexible measures instead of waiting for mass destruction orders. Over 190 apiaries joined a pilot network from disease-free places like the Australian Capital Territory to hot zones in New South Wales. Even remote schools included community hives in their curriculum as a living lesson in human adaptation to nature. Surprisingly, as people struggled to adapt, the bees themselves showed resilience. In many apiaries, worker bees were seen grooming mites off each other more often or removing infected brood before Varroa could reproduce. Science calls this Varroa, sensitive hygiene and grooming behavior. These seemingly small traits became important clues. Researchers and commercial breeders immediately began propagating queen bees from the toughest colonies. At the same time, farmers changed their habits. Instead of relying solely on honeybees, they encouraged over 1,700 native bee species naturally immune to Varroa to help with pollination. Many farms restored wildflower meadows, turning the landscape into pollination service stations. For honeybees, they used integrated pest management rotating miticides to prevent resistance cutting brood combs to break Varroa's life cycle, even giving colonies a rest period after peak pollination. In other words, beekeeping shifted from passive and uniform to proactive and diverse. But bees and farmers were not alone. Technology quickly became a new ally. Bee right sensors were installed directly in hives recording temperature, humidity, mite density, and sending real-time data to a central hub. Artificial intelligence and infrared cameras analyzed bee behavior spotting abnormalities within hours. In the laboratory, genomics helped quickly select resistant colonies, while CRISPR-Cas9 and nanopore sequencing cut years of research down to months paving the way for finding natural resistance genes. Thanks to this from being a bee graveyard in 2022, just two years later, Australia has turned itself into a living laboratory where bees, farmers, and technology might well, work together to find the formula for surviving with Varroa. By mid-2024, these efforts began to bear fruit. In New South Wales, the original epicenter, many apiaries kept Varroa levels below five mites per 100 adult bees, the threshold considered safe before a colony is at risk of collapse. The 2024 almond season, the biggest test needing over 300,000 hives for pollination, was tense, but ended better than expected. Hive rental prices remained high around $150 to $170 per hive, but there was no severe bee shortage. Farmers breathed a sigh of relief, flowers set fruit export contracts were kept, and global almond prices did not spike. A CSIRO study showed that thanks to the new monitoring and sensor network hive losses in the first half of 2024, dropped 20% compared to 2023, even though the disease was still present. In fact, many urban apiaries in Sydney and Melbourne reported stronger than expected colonies thanks to breeding disease-resistant queens. Still, the danger has not disappeared. Varroa continues to spread to new states and many farmers remain highly vigilant. As one beekeeper shared, we do not dream of zero Varroa anymore. Now the goal is just to keep the bees healthy enough to get through the flowering season, and this year at least we did that. This is not a total victory, but it proves one thing from a desperate crisis. Australia is gradually finding a way to survive and maybe even thrive with Varroa. By July 2024, Varroa Destructor is no longer an invisible enemy. 
Heading into 2025, Australia's response is shifting to a new phase building long-term resilience. States like Victoria and Queensland have launched mobile applications for real-time mite tracking, allowing beekeepers to record infestation levels, treatment cycles, and hive health with data synced to a national database. This network not only helps each farmer react quickly, but also turns Australia's entire beekeeping sector into an early warning system, a collective force against a parasite that once spread hopelessness. Australia's Varroa story is not just a tragedy for beekeepers, it is a wake-up call for global agriculture. Reality has shown that wiping out this mite is nearly impossible. The only way to survive is to learn to manage it smartly and for the long term. The first lesson monitor early use real-time data to catch outbreaks before it is too late. The second do not rely solely on honeybees restore habitats and use native bees to make the pollination system more resilient. The third breed Varroa resistant bees, even if it takes time, it is the only way for the industry to have a future. And finally, the cooperation of the beekeeping community is essential. Without trust and transparent compensation, any control plan will fail from the start. From painful losses to bold experiments, Australia has shown the world that living with Varroa is not the end, it can be a new beginning. What do you think was Australia right to accept living with Varroa instead of chasing a zero Varroa goal? Share your thoughts in the comments and do not forget to like and subscribe to follow more strange and surprising stories.